This is experiencing technical problems should inform the committee staff immediately. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at this remote hearing today. Today, we're looking at how we can advance environmental justice through climate action. And I recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. You know, during our last committee hearing, uh, the West faced an unprecedented heat wave, one that shattered temperature records, it melted power cables, and tragically took the lives of nearly 200 Americans. The extreme heat capped the hottest June in our nation's history. And scientists warned it would have been virtually impossible without the influence of human-caused climate change. This week, Unfortunately, a new and dangerous heat wave is threatening summer crops, sparking wildfires, straining power grids, and putting more lives in danger. And on the East Coast, commuters waded through waist-deep water to reach the New York City subway after heavy rains flooded uh, underground stations across the city. There is no denying it. We are in a climate crisis, and we must act boldly to keep temperatures in check uh, as we help to help our neighborhoods to adapt to threats that are already here. From scorching heat waves to stronger storms, the climate crisis affects each community differently, but its worst effects are felt by Americans in environmental justice communities, which include communities of color, low income communities, and indig indigenous communities. That's why environmental justice must be at the center of climate action. It's why environmental justice is the cornerstone of our climate crisis action plan. And it's why today we'll focus on advancing environmental justice through climate action. Throughout our history, black, brown, indigenous and low income Americans have been disproportionately harmed by pollution. And today they're more, more vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Black American children are five times likelier than white children to be admitted to the hospital for asthma. Latinos are twice as likely to live in areas threatened by wildfires. Communities that have few trees or places to cool off have deadlier outcomes uh, when the weather hits triple digits. Tribes are watching their way of life disrupted by climate-fueled weather extremes, wildlife loss, and sea level rise. And in Puerto Rico, families are still living with blue plastic tarps over their homes nearly four years after Hurricane Maria blew, the, blew away their roofs. This is not a coincidence. Environmental justice communities have long been harmed by chronic underinvestment and systemic failures that make it harder for them to bounce back after disaster strikes. They've also been subject to racist zoning codes mortgage lending discrimination, and dis disproportionate proximity to factories, waste sites, and other sources of pollution. Climate change acts as a threat multiplier, taking existing social and economic inequities and making them worse. That's why climate action must be centered in righting these wrongs, ensuring we do not repeat the mistakes and injustices of the past. Solving the climate crisis is about more than just reducing pollution. It's about boosting resilience in vulnerable communities. And it's about repairing the legacy of environmental racism. And as we expand clean energy and rebuild our infrastructure, we have to be intentional about elevating environmental justice communities to make sure these, the benefits are reaching the most vulnerable Americans. Thanks to the leadership of colleagues like Representative McEachin, we've made progress on this front as we listen to the priorities of environmental justice communities and translate them into solutions. We passed President Biden's American Rescue Plan, which included critical funding for environmental justice programs at EPA. We also passed the Invest in America Act, which makes record investments in mass transit, expands funding for water infrastructure and resilience, and creates a groundbreaking program to reconnect environmental justice communities divided by highways. This is going to be a very important hearing for all of us, uh, and I look forward to hearing our outstanding witnesses. At this time, I'll turn it over to Ranking Member Graves for his five-minute opening statement. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to welcome uh, Ms. Flowers, Ms. Cooley, uh, Dr. Parks, and uh, Mr. Mr. Holly. Thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to your testimony. Uh, when, when we talk about environmental justice, I think it's important that we, that we talk about disadvantaged communities. I think it's important that we look at policies that have been carried out and, and use evidence to inform uh, our, our policies, our bills, our legislation, our strategies as we move forward to a clean energy future, a cleaner energy future in the United States. And I know that my friends, Mr. Huffman and Mr. Levin are going to be shocked to hear me cite California as an example today, but um, uh, I do. I want to I cite California because um, I think it's an example of how flawed policies can actually be regressive and can um, actually exacerbate challenges that some of our disadvantaged communities uh, may be experiencing. Uh, it can cause disproportionate burdens uh, to those communities. And in the state of California, um, a, a coalition of, of civil rights uh, leaders uh, have actually sued the state over the aggressive impact of climate policies on, on their disadvantaged communities. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, you can look right now and, and that these programs, these policies uh, have resulted in the state of California, Californians paying 50% more on average for electricity cost and about 80 cents more per gallon to fuel uh, their cars. Uh, and that is compared to the national average. As a matter of fact, in the lawsuit that was filed against the state of California, um, uh, citing these regressive policies, they say, um, California's climate change policies and specifically those policies that increase the cost and delay or reduce the availability of housing that increase the cost of transportation fuels and intentionally worsen highway congestion to lengthen commute times and further increase elect electricity cost have caused and will cause unconstitutional and unlawful disparate impacts to California's minority populations. California's climate policies guarantee that housing, transportation, and electricity prices will continue to rise, while gateway jobs to the middle class for those without college degrees, such as manufacturing and logistics, will continue to locate in other states. And I think we've seen that. California's policies uh, have resulted in some of actually the highest emissions growth in, in the United States, and it's a disturbing trend in that you're causing disproportionate impacts to disadvantaged communities and actually resulting in higher emissions. And I remind you, the state of California is the only state with five severe non-attainment uh, areas in, in the state. Um, uh, therefore, as the chair talked about, the cases of asthma and other health challenges that disproportionately impact our kids um, certainly are, are exacerbated in that state as a result of policies that are purported to help to address climate change and reduce emissions. Um, my home state of Louisiana, if California rates applied, we'd be paying approximately triple the electricity bills that we currently pay in our state, um, and and if we're going to talk about um, if we're going to talk about uh, disproportionate impact and environmental justice, I want to remind the committee, my home state of Louisiana, we have one of the highest African American populations um, uh, percentages in the United States. We have one of the highest percentages of those impoverished. Let's talk about environmental justice, the justice. Uh, to our state, to our citizens, whenever the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers levied the rivers, causing the greatest loss of wetlands in the continental United States, constituting 90% of that loss. And unfortunately, many of my friends that are on this committee that talk about their willingness or their desire to restore the environment and protect disadvantaged communities are repeatedly fighting our efforts to restore our coastal ecosystem, to protect these communities uh, from dangerous storms, hurricanes, and floods. Um, and so it's, it's especially concerning that, that as we move forward, we move forward based on science, based on data, based on evidence, and building upon the success that the United States has had in, in reducing emissions more than the next 12 emissions reducing 
countries combined. Uh, so Madam Chair, with that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and yield back. Okay, there we go. Without objection, uh, members who wish to enter opening statements into the record have five business days to do so. Now I'd like to welcome our witnesses. Uh, we will hear from prominent community leaders and researchers on why it's critical to invest in environmental justice. Catherine Coleman Flowers is the founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. She is an internationally recognized advocate for the human right to water and sanitation, and she works to improve access to clean air, water, and soil in marginalized rural communities. In 2020, Ms. Flowers received the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship. Nikki Cooley is the co-manager of the Tribes and Climate Change Program as well as the Interim Assistant Director of the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals at Northern Arizona University. Ms. Cooley leads a program to help tribal nations as they address and prepare for climate impacts. She works with tribal and indigenous partners across the continental United States and Alaska on climate change adaptation, mitigation, and resilience planning. Ms. Cooley is of the Diné Navajo Nation. Derek Holly is the founder and president of Reaching America, a nonprofit organization with a focus on African American outreach. Mr. Holly has over 25 years of experience in advertising and marketing. Dr. Ji Sung Park is an assistant professor of public policy at UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. Dr. Park is an expert in environmental economics, labor economics, and public finance. His research, research focuses on how, how climate change affects social and economic outcomes. In particular, Dr. Park studies the labor uh, and human capital impacts of climate change, the prospects for long run climate adaptation and environmental determinants of economic mobility. Without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, with that, Ms. Flowers, you are now recognized to give a five minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and all the members of the Select Committee for the opportunity to testify. Again, my name is Catherine Coleman Flowers. I'm the Rural Development Manager for the Equal Justice Initiative and the Founding Director of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. I also serve as a practitioner in residence at Duke University, a member of the Board of Advisors for the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary, as well as the boards of the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Climate Reality Project. As uh, Chair Castor stated, in 2020, I was awarded the MacArthur Fellowship in Environmental Health and I authored the book entitled Waste, One Woman's Fight Against America's Dirty Secret. In this book, I uncovered the extent to which rural America has been denied access to sustainable and resilient sanitation infrastructure. I am a proud native of Lowndes County, Alabama, a rural area located between Selma and Montgomery. Lowndes County too has a proud history of fighting for equality and the right to vote. In addition, in the early 1900s, sharecroppers organized for jobs and justice. Many of his sons and later his daughters, including my father, my three brothers and myself served in the United States military. We have a deep legacy of holding up core democratic values even when they failed us. Most of all, I stand on the values I learned as a country girl that grew up with a healthy respect for nature and I appreciate what our creator has provided for us, which includes the knowledge to know when we are out of balance with creation. That failure is exemplified through fish kills, more powerful storms, higher groundwater tables in some areas, drought in other areas, floods, unsafe mobile homes, high electric bills, pollution, straight piping of raw sewage, or failing wastewater systems. I have often taken policymakers, philanthropists, and people from both sides of the aisle, from Jeff Sessions to Doug Jones to Robert Woodson to Lowndes County, to see the infrastructure inequalities that exist and to hear from local people what is needed to address them. At the height of the pandemic, Lowndes County had the highest death and infection rate per capita for COVID in the state of Alabama. Sadly, as one travels through Lowndes County, now the fresh graves of the victims of COVID are a constant reminder of what happens when poverty, inequality, 
failing or no sanitation infrastructure and climate change comes together. The climate crisis impacts all of us, whether one is in Louisiana, which has been losing at least 25 square miles of land per year, or in Alabama where more intense tropical storms can harm housing, roads, transportation arteries, or more valuable infrastructure. Throughout our nation, we are dealing with failing infrastructure and it includes the most basic infrastructure, sanitation. Because I'm a country girl, I like to speak in plain English, like I would if I were at home speaking to local people, my relatives. In the town of Hainville, Alabama, the county seat of Lowndes, for more than 20 years, Ms. Charlie Mae Hawkham has been telling people about the sewage from a nearby lagoon that has been backing up into her home. Yet the failing infrastructure continues to fail and she continues to cry for help. She is paying a wastewater treatment fee, yet all the town can provide is a pump truck to pump sewage out of her yard from time to time. The failure is more pronounced when there is a hard rain. This is emblematic of failing wastewater infrastructure across the United States. It is something we need to address and our rural communities should not be left to their own devices as they struggle to, co to co cope with the climate crisis and the lack of investment in sustainable infrastructure that goes back decades. Failure is repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Despite being knowledgeable of the failures of the lagoon system, a similar design uh, to the one in Hayward was being planned in the town of Whitehall along Highway 80. This sewage lagoon was sitting next to an elementary school. The liability for failing septic tanks in this system would be transferred to homeowners. This does not consider the failures that already exist here and around the nation, nor does it account for a changing climate producing more rainfall in many areas, nor does it consider the health and well being of the residents or the nation. Yet it begs the question how can federal money be used to buy equipment that does not come with any service or performance warranties? Yet, when we know they, yet, especially when we know they fail not only in Lowndes County, but throughout the nation. This is indicative of the sanitation inequality that exists throughout the U.S., whether in Montgomery, Alabama, where older black communities are on failing septic tanks, or in Martin County, Kentucky, where poor white families are asking for environmental justice and good paying jobs as well. The American Jobs Plan provides an opportunity to deal with the climate crisis head on in forgotten rural black, brown, and indigenous communities that are experiencing the most severe job losses, untimely deaths, poor living conditions and health, health crises. It is a chance to right some wrongs of all marginalized communities and make America a model of ingenuity where we have clean air, clean water, resilient infrastructure and good paying jobs for everyone. With this funding should come guardrails that will ensure that Ms. Charlie May will not get more sewage in her yard. Lagoons are not built next to schools and each on-site system or infrastructure placed in elected communities should come with the same performance and parts warranties that we have come to expect from a car, a hot water heater, or a heating and cooling system. These guardrails should include stringent enforcement so the people of Alabama, Louisiana, Texas, and wherever our great nation uh, needs working infrastructure will get the relief and protection that from the climate crisis. It will be neglectful not to mention Cancer Alley, which sits along the Mississippi River, where residents combat cancer rates due to pollution and one and are one climate crisis away from a catastrophic event that could overshadow Hurricane Katrina. We can make a difference and do something now. As a child, I learned in Sunday school that we all have the power to do good and change our communities for the better, and we should. Therefore, I implore our leaders and policymakers to recognize the areas outside of urban centers that do not have the privilege to flush and forget. And those who are losing their homes to sea level rise, roads that are being destroyed and their homes do not provide safe haven from extreme heat or storms. Change the formula for disaster relief to enable all Americans to receive recovery recovery aid and to include people that are renters, live on heirs property or in rural communities that are not densely populated. Invest in clean infrastructure for all, prioritizing communities that have been left behind. And most of all, we together should confront this climate crisis for our children, our grandchildren and generations to come. I thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today it was an honor and I look forward to continuing conversation about environmental and climate justice for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Cooley, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Yate, Chair Kathy Castor, Ranking Member Garrett Graves, and members of the Select Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today to speak on the significant actions of Native Americans and Alaska Native communities in addressing the climate crisis. I acknowledge all of the tribal and indigenous people on whose traditional lands we are working and living on. I acknowledge all of my relatives listening in on this important hearing. I'm of the Tyron House clan. I'm born for the Reed People clan. Maternal grandfathers are from the Water That Flows Together clan. Paternal grandfathers are from the Many Goats clan. I am from the Diné Navajo Nation, Shanto and Blue Gap, Arizona. I reside in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I co-manage the Tribes and Climate Change program housed uh, under the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. A recent effort by ITEP was to convene the development of the inaugural status of tribes and climate change report. Although it has not been published, I will highlight three of the 12 chapters, including key messages and recommendations. On the Diné Navajo Nation, we are seeing the drastic impacts of the extreme aridification of our lands. My people have to haul water for their families, their livestock, and their crops. That is getting harder due to low water levels. Our nation has had to implement water rations, forcing families to make the hard decision to decrease or sell their livestock, which is devastating to those who depend on them for money and for food. Our relatives on the coastline and in Alaska are experiencing the consequences of coastal erosion and water rising sea levels, forcing them to plan for relocation. In recent years, wildfires and winter storms have caused power outages impacting those most vulnerable. A key philosophy of tribal nations is water is life. Water sustains our bodies, our environment, and our economies. Unfortunately, many tribal nations do not have reliable or adequate access to safe drinking water. The in in insufficient drinking water infrastructure combined with aridification decrease in groundwater recharge contributes to the imbalance of health of the health of the environment and people the report recommends funding for not only the installation but operation and maintenance of water drinking water infrastructure the climate resilient infrastructure could potentially decrease long-term costs and water ability to access safe and reliable drinking water is a privilege but it's also a basic human right. I recall very vividly doing my college homework by kerosene lamps and later using a generator and headlights, headlamps. I recall the uncertainty of the mine shutting down because of job loss. Adding to that loss was the failed opportunity to train former mine workers in the reclamation process. There still is the opportunity for tribes and local jobs uh, for tribes to create local jobs and training opportunities for solar and wind facilities. Our people will not have to leave the reservation. Tribal nations require the support in terms of financing, training, and access to the resources. My umbilical cord is buried at my family's home, and I'm continually reminded of where I come from and what I have to protect. We are inherently bonded with the earth, through our prayers, our ceremonies, and ways of life. Due to climate change, many communities are facing the, the threat from uh, rising sea levels, coastal erosion, permafrost melt. This not only threatens the land base, but the people's safety, emotional, and physical well being. The STAC report highlights inadequate funding, agency coordination, local capacity, and technical capacity as significant barriers for tribes. Current infrastructure is at risk, and if we wait any longer to address these threats, there will be significant long-term costs. I am the daughter of someone who worked at the Peabody coal mine on the Navajo reservation for over 30 years. I know all too well the need for a just transition to a sustainable economy that not only focuses on cleaner energy, such as wind and solar, but building an adequate and sustainable future uh, infrastructure that will protect the people, the environment, but also promote economic security. I stress the importance of acknowledging the unique challenges Native Americans face. 
Climate change impacts are becoming more frequent, giving less time for recovery, preparation, and increasing costs. I implore the committee to uh, recognize the stack report as an opportunity to learn more in depth about what tribal nations are doing to protect themselves and their communities against the climate crisis while exploring significant ways to support them. I implore the committee to include and recognize the leadership of tribes uh, in addressing the climate <coughs> crisis, which is and always will be at their doorstep. And as an elder recently said, what we do today we do for the next seven generations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Holly, you are recognized for five minutes. Greetings, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to allow me to speak today. I'm Derek Holly, President of Reach in America, an education and policy organization I've developed to address social issues impacting African American communities. One of the issues I do the most work on is reducing energy poverty. Energy poverty occurs when low-income families or individuals are unable to afford basic heating, electric, and gas needs. Some of these Americans spend more than 25% or more of their total income on an electric bill. Now, eliminating energy poverty is a goal I think we all should be interested in achieving. However, in working towards that goal, we need to be mindful of how policies will impact the same communities that you claim to protect with this kind of proposed legislation. We all know the communities around the country, particularly low income, minority, rural and senior citizen communities suffer from a lack of access to reliable energy sources and spend proportionally much more, much higher amounts on electricity costs. Today's hearing advancing environmental justice through climate action sounds great. However, it would be much more prudent and productive for everyone to include energy poverty in the conversation. Why? Because the same communities and people that you claim to protect through environmental justice are the same communities and people who are struggling with energy poverty. For the record, I do think climate change exists. However, I do not believe there is a climate crisis and the narrative is very misleading. Also the so-called solutions are misleading as well. They promote false hope and unrealistic outcomes for America. And here's why. There's not a poll, a survey or any research that would suggest that climate change is a major issue or even a conversation in the black community, because it's not. And we have the media to blame for that. Most black people think getting shot by a police officer is the biggest issue, and we know that's not true either. My sister is a devoted Democrat and just waited seven months for her new vehicle to be delivered because they couldn't get the various chips needed to complete her car. Early this week, I had to settle on a rental car because there are shortage of cars due to the lack of chips. There are solar companies right now voicing their concerns because they can't get the materials either that they need. This is a supply chain issue for precious minerals like cobalt. Cobalt is needed for every solar panel, lithium battery, cell phone, and radiation treatment. Over 60% of the world's cobalt comes from the Congo, being mined in most cases by little black kids. When we have, co we have a cobalt mine right here in Minnesota that's trying to be shut down by environmental groups. And to me, this is very racist and a glaring example of the hypocrisy that exists. Why is it okay for little black kids of mine for, for cobalt in Africa? Shouldn't environmental justice be a global issue or is it just for here, us in America? Right now, we see electric charging stations going up everywhere, even in communities where they're not being used. Studies show that an estimated 90% of electric vehicle owners earn over $100,000 a year and then you get your little tax credit. Most people living in these vulnerable communities do not make that kind of income and are not interested in an electric vehicle. It's very easy to see how these environmental justice policies will do more harm than good to these individuals. In closing, my grandfather was a black coal miner in Southwest Virginia, and I had the opportunity to visit that area. The poverty that exists in rural America is different, much different from the urban cities. And these people have never recovered from the mines that closed decades ago. My fear, Madam Chair, is the same will happen to healthy, thriving communities that relied on good oil paying oil and gas jobs for generations. I know plenty of folks in Houston, Dallas, Louisiana, who work in the industry and they are not in agreement with any policies, new policies or regulations that will ultimately destroy their lifestyles. I'm a licensed captain. I fished in the Atlantic and in the Gulf. 
And as an environmental steward, I recognize we have to protect our planet. However, the bottom line is we need to do it sensibly. I think we all would agree that American people have gone through enough with the uncertainty that still exists from the global pandemic of COVID-19. The last thing we need to do is take away good paying jobs, disrupt people's lifestyle more than it already has and destroy an industry that we have relied on for centuries. The same industry that has allowed us to create, an, create Americans, the lifestyle that we've grown, appreciate, we've grown to appreciate. From petrochemicals, including plastics, fibers, pharmaceuticals, even your yoga mat comes from fossil fuels. Roughly 80% of our energy mix comes from fossil fuels. That's oil, natural gas, and coal. It was that way at the turn of the century. It was that way when my grandfather was a black coal miner. It's that way today. And we're not going to get where we're not going to get there by the flip of a switch. We need market-oriented policy that will allow America to keep exploring and developing our own natural resources safely while we transition to much cleaner energy and still allow us to maintain our energy and supply chain independence. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, Dr. Park, you're recognized for five minutes. Great. So thank you, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the Select Committee uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ji Sung Park, and I am an assistant professor at UCLA. Uh, UCLA. My training is as a PhD economist, and given this training, uh, I see my job primarily as to help us learn from data and economic statistics, not so much to make political statements. But in this case, the data seems to tell an increasingly robust and compelling story regarding the interactions between climate change, extreme heat in particular, and economic opportunity and inequality. So with my time, I'd like to focus on three main points. The first is that we're only beginning to learn the full economic consequences of hotter temperature, in part because the effects of hotter temperature are often quite subtle and may evade traditional tools of measurement. I'll tell you what I mean by that in a moment. Second, in the research that is available, it appears to be the case that heat has highly unequal consequences, not only across rich and poor countries, but also within countries, within states, and even perhaps within individual congressional districts which would suggest that climate change without remedial investments could actually exacerbate recent trends in economic inequality. And third, the findings from this research, much of which has really just come online in the last four or five years, suggests that not only should we be engaging in aggressive climate mitigation, that is transitioning away from fossil fuels, but that policymakers may also want to think proactively about climate adaptation. So in the time that I have remaining, I'd like to try to illustrate these points in the context uh, of the effects of heat on workers. So my colleagues at UCLA and Stanford and I were able to analyze over 11 million workers' compensation claims. And what we find is that hotter temperature significantly increases the risk of workplace injury. For example, if you're working on a day above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, this increases injuries by up to 15% on that day, such that in California alone, we estimate that heat may be causing tens of thousands of workplace injuries per year, many of which lead to permanent disabilities and wage loss. Now, what's important to note here is that the vast majority of these cases are not officially recognized as being heat related because they mainly pertain to things like falling off of a ladder, being hit by a moving crane, getting your hand caught in manufacturing machinery. Moreover, we find that heat is not only a problem for outdoor workers in construction or agriculture, but also for many indoor workers. Think of industries like manufacturing, warehousing, and wholesale. So we think this is important given the nearly exclusive policy attention, at least to date, on heat illnesses as opposed to injuries and also on outdoor workers. And again, here's where the details really seem to matter when it comes to climate inequality. You know, how much heat hurts is very much a function of individual and local factors like income, occupation, or which neighborhood you live in. For example, we find that the effect of heat on injuries appears to be at least five times larger for workers in the bottom quintile of the income distribution relative to the top, in part because they're just that much more likely to work in dangerous occupations and industries and to live and work in more extreme climates. And these patterns of highly local climate inequality appear to persist across a number of research settings, whether that's the effect of heat on learning, which is something that I've worked on, 
heat on violent crime, or even maternal uh, and all-cause mortality. And again, it's worth underscoring how, you know, this is not an issue 100 years from now, right? These effects are occurring right now and are likely to become much more acute, particularly given the amount of warming we've baked into the system. Just, just as an example, right? Chair Castor, voters in your district, they, they can expect to experience over 60 additional days per year above 90 degrees Fahrenheit within their lifetimes, even with aggressive climate mitigation. And so the upshot to conclude, in my opinion, is that as policymakers, we, want, we may wanna use this opportunity to think carefully about how to build smart adaptation mechanisms into whatever climate policies are put in place. And at least when it comes to heat, it appears that doing so may have inequality reducing benefits as well. So in my written testimony, uh, I outlined some important data gaps uh, and additional policy implications at the federal level around infrastructure, racial achievement gaps, uh, and air pollution, which hopefully we can speak to in more detail uh, during the Q&A. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to our discussion. Well, I want to thank the witnesses for their very insightful testimony, and I'll recognize myself for five minutes for uh, questions. Uh, there's a common theme in all of your testimony today, and that is how we move ahead on equitable and just climate policy, and it's got to be more than simply reducing carbon pollution. Uh, we've got to tackle the tackle environmental racism and uh, help improve the lives of everyday Americans, no matter who they are, where they live. Uh, Ms. Flowers, I, I heard you loud and clear about the differences you have seen in just simple things like wastewater treatment. And, you know, we just in the House passed the Invest in America Act, where we've made historic investments in wastewater treatment um, this is on the front burner for me here in, in Tampa because when we have these extreme rain events, our sewers overflow, it's pretty gross. And now we have so much nutrient in Tampa Bay, we have a massive fish kill, red tide, they say, the scientists now say it's gonna last longer because the waters are warmer. I mean, this is a toxic stew, we've, we've got to repair and strengthen critical infrastructure and do a better job. What you talked about the, the chronicle, the challenge is pretty well. What opportunities do you see if we really can deliver on significant historic investments in cleaning up the water and make sure we target those uh, investments to communities of color and, and communities on the front line. What opportunities do you see? Like, get specific with us. Well, I think there are a number of opportunities. I think one of the opportunities we'll be seeing uh, pretty quickly in, in the health outcomes, because we did a, a, a parasite study where we found evidence of tropical parasites in, in Lowndes County, where people did not have access to, to, to adequate sanitation. And the people that had the highest parasite loads were the people like Ms. The, the one that I mentioned, Ms. 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 Hawkham, who had raw sewage coming back into their homes. And I think the second outcome would be that it can provide jobs and good paying jobs to people in the community where they don't feel like they have to leave and go to the cities or go to other areas to find jobs. And then of course, I think the third thing is the economic, uh, the economic opportunities in terms of of being able to recruit businesses to come. I mean, in those communities where you don't have adequate sanitation, businesses are not going to locate there. I used to be the economic development coordinator for Lowndes County. And one of the things they wanna know is what kind of infrastructure is there. And without infrastructures, those communities will continue to remain poor. And they would not even have the, the opportunity to recruit basic services that they need in those areas without functioning infrastructure. So those are some immediate outcomes that we could see. Yeah, and we know that the American Society of Civil Engineers ranked uh, our infrastructure in the U.S. with a C minus grade, but when it comes to wastewater, D plus, schools, D plus. Uh, so I know there are enormous opportunities out there to do better. And, and Ms. Cooley, you mentioned that for tribal nations, you have your eye on solar and wind power. How do you see this as a big job creator? Uh, the, making these investments in renewable energy? Yes, definitely. Um, as uh, Ms. Ms. Flowers uh, mentioned that these jobs will 
um, train former mine workers and their families and the upcoming generations for solar and wind industries based on the reservation, based on tribal lands, so they do not have to go off the reservation, away from their families and away from what they what they basically have known for all their lives. So it's important that we keep these um, um, our people on the reservations, but the jobs and the training opportunities are immense. As a member of one of the largest Native American tribes out there, there's great potential uh, for job creation. Thank you. Dr. Park, your recent uh, research is, is eye-opening. Previously, official estimates uh, have been that exposure to heat causes about 4,000 workplace injuries a year, but you, in your review of worker compensation claims, you say that no, it's closer to 15,000 or more just in California. Is that correct? Why, why have agencies like the, the National uh, Institute of Occupational Health, Health or Bureau of Labor Statistics completely miss this? Uh, certainly within uh, our estimates. Uh, I'm not a physician, but my understanding is that heat illnesses and injuries due to heat are one of those things that are just quite difficult to attribute definitively forensically on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and in order to actually do this, you need a vast amount of data and to look at it in a way that allows you to look at the excess uh, due to heat. Um, but more broadly, I think this is in part uh, a, a function of lack of data collection and interest in this issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, we're gonna go to Ms. Miller. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Okay. Thank you so much, Chair Kester, and for ranking member Graves. And thank you to all of the witnesses here today. We have an awful lot in common. I want to paint a picture now of what is happening in Appalachia. There are thousands of homes without sanitary sewage or septic service. That means human waste goes right into the creeks and the rivers. There is a high rate of opioid use and drug overdoses. There are adverse health impacts in our communities compared to our surrounding regions and much more. But these impacts are not a result of climate change as my colleagues would like you to believe, but rather they are caused by the policies of destroying energy communities. If justice is really what we're here to talk about today, where is the justice for these communities that have been left behind? by these policies. Both energy poverty and poverty caused by dangerous policies must be considered by this committee. However, we're never gonna have those discussions if we continue to have reports like the one of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council as guidance to be on by the administration. This council stated that projects like carbon capture nuclear power, research and development, or any road improvements would not benefit communities. Are you kidding me? These findings are against what I believe my colleagues across the aisles generally believe and that we should all be concerned with, that these are the principles that are supposed to guide this administration. If we continue down this same radical path, we're only gonna put more people at risk. Mr. Hawley, Energy poverty is a very real, and in many communities, experience it. How can the policies of shifting solely to renewables increase energy poverty in the communities? Oh, simple. It's going, when you switch to solar and there's renewables, it's going to drive up the cost of the energy, the price of energy in these communities. And I'm going to say, like I say I'm not against transitioning, but we just got to do it slowly and sensibly. I agree. What do you think the impact of that will be on people's health? In, in terms of jobs and, and what it's going to do to those communities, it's going to be devastating. Just like it's, look, I had a chance to go back to the Appalachia, Southwest Virginia, where my grandfather was a black coal miner, and I've seen the poverty. I've seen how people live back there. There are people right now who have blue tarps on their house with tires holding it down because they can't afford to get their roofs fixed. So that's how bad the poverty is in Appalachia. I just spent an entire day yesterday in McDowell County discussing just those things with people that live there. 
you probably have seen the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council's report on environmental justice. As I mentioned, the report outlines a multitude of policies that wouldn't benefit a community, such as infrastructure repair, procurement of nuclear power, carbon capture, and research and development. What do you think of these findings? I mean, how would they increase energy poverty? I, I think it'll again, be devastating to these communities. And one of the things we've talked about too is just you know minority impact assessments. How, let's do a study to show how these new policies will impact these vulnerable communities. And so I think that will be a start to help us all understand how this environmental justice and these kind of policies and the kind of what it will do to these, these particular communities. And we all share that. What policy should we put in place to reduce energy poverty? Sensible energy policy that won't harm the environment and won't harm the people who need the energy the most. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. All right, next, uh, Rep McEachin, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this, uh, for this hearing and this opportunity to have a conversation with these uh, knowledgeable witnesses. Um, the theme that I want to talk about right now is consultation. Um, and I'll direct my first question to Ms. Coleman Flowers. Um, part of the administration's work on this initiative um, and of my work with uh, Chairman Grijalva and EJ for All has centered on discussion and coordination with and outreach to EJ communities. Meaningful participation in this process from impacted EJ communities can help make sure that we are truly addressing the needs of these communities. Um, as you've worked in this space, can you share with us what is the benefit of this type of consultation? What ills can befall these communities if they're not all, if they are not con uh, consulted with? Thank you for that question, Representative McKeachin. Uh, one of the things that, first of all, I come from an EJ community and I've lived in rural communities and I've lived in poverty. And oftentimes people that try to craft well-intentioned solutions don't know what it's like to deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why I try to take people to see it firsthand. See people like Pamela Rush who died last year in July from COVID because her home, which was not energy efficient and had been that way for quite some time because it was a mobile home where she got uh, a mortgage that, that she shouldn't have received, but her family was suffering from, from a lot of the issues that we talk about today that most people have never even dreamed about. We've taken people there who couldn't stay in the house for more than five year, five minutes because they had never seen anything like that before. And when we don't consult with communities, you don't go and see for yourself. Oftentimes people are doing more harm than good. And I would all, always invite everyone who's involved in policy. Some people oftentimes are trying to use an urban lens to, to solve these problems. But the same thing is true for environmental justice. If you had to live down in St. James Parish and smell that stuff day in and day out and then have to you know, deal with it on a regular basis, I think that people will have a different kind of perspective on it. So we have to consult with the community because oftentimes they know what the solutions are. They've never been asked. It's usually being crafted by people that are creating the problems instead of people that want to be part of the solution. Would, would you agree that we in Washington have to resist the temptation to try to find one solution that tries to fit all EJ communities rather than consult with them? Because as you just suggested, oftentimes they have the answer. Someone just needs to ask the right question. That's correct. I mean, I think that I'm not an expert on Flint because I didn't grow up in an urban area, but I can certainly tell you about living in Lowndes County and what it's like going to an outhouse, et cetera. So I think that we have to consult with people in communities because there are different problems in different communities. But I also think that it's important to note that the people in the community oftentimes have the solution. They just haven't been asked. Right. I, could, I couldn't agree more, which is one of the challenges of implementing this program is that we need to make sure that we are consulting with these folks, uh, letting them come up with their solutions, helping them implement those solutions and then get out of their way while they fix their communities. Ms. Cooley, uh, again, I wanna thank you for participating in today's hearing. Along a similar line, you note in your testimony that indigenous people should be consulted thoughtfully from the earliest stages of policy and research development, legal policy, ethical and cultural best practices and requirements should be followed 
to make consultation meaningful. While this pra practice has tragically not always been followed by the federal government in its interactions with indigenous people, can you tell us what it looks like when it goes right? Thank you for that question. Um, well, I think um, it's been outlined that when you provide uh, meaningful partnership, um, adequate financing, access to resources, that a community thrives and you provide that support in the long term. Um, uh, the it is there's some um, there's a statistic out there where it said that the Native American uh, communities receive twenty or three dollars per person for disaster emergency funds, where the average U.S. citizen receives twenty six dollars um, per person, and there's a big um, difference in that. So. Um, you are giving them a, not just a seat at the table and not just checking off a box, but you're taking that meaningful action to engage them, to remove that barriers, but, uh, and also strengthen tribal sovereignty. You're also honoring that trust responsibility of the, the government um, that, they, that they have to Native American tribes and, and whatnot. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I just want to reiterate again that uh, we must invest in environmental justice in disadvantaged communities that have seen historical underinvestment. We need to listen to them as we look forward to uh, reaching a carbon zero uh, uh, society. I appreciate the witnesses weighing in on how we might do so. I look forward to working with my colleagues and administration to ensure that we follow through on our promises with meaningful investments uh, in these communities and, and not just a one size fits all response. Madam Chair, I yield back. And again, I thank you for your courtesy. Well, thank you for your leadership, Rep. McEachin. Next, we'll go to Ranking Member Graves. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank all the witnesses for your testimony. That was a uh, uh, helpful input and appreciate it very much. Ms. Flowers, uh, I want to ask you a question. You were on the, um, the, the, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory uh, council, I, I believe, and, and there was a, a recommendation in, the, in that report, it was on page 55, and it said, it would be unreasonable to have any climate investment working against harmed communities. Uh, so so uh, it would be unreasonable to have any climate investment working against harmed communities. W with that in mind, sh should the United States be pursuing any policies uh, that that support directly or indirectly uh, forced labor or slave labor or child labor uh, anywhere in the world to to advance uh, clean energy goals in our country. Well, that's a good question. But first of all, I can't speak on behalf of the WEJAC, but I can give you my personal opinion. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that the United States should support human rights no matter where it is. But I also believe that we shouldn't do any kind of harm. I've seen it, you know, when I went to St. James and St. John's Parish myself, uh, I am just, you know, FYI, when I trace my, my family history, I can trace it back to Louisiana, actually to some of the original Cajuns that came from, from Canada and went back to Canada. So I, I, I have, my, my, my interest in what happens in Louisiana is more than as an activist, but also as having family there in Sicily Island and Catahoula Parish. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> and, like, well, look, we're having our family reunion in December. You should come. <laughs> we might be cousins. But, <laughs> but anyway, I would love to. Uh, I think that what we have to do is find, uh, we have to find solutions as we, as the previous question that was asked, uh, there is no one size fit all solution to this problem. However, I think that what the what the intended statement was, and this is my opinion, not official, an official statement, is that we should do no harm in communities that have already been harmed. Yeah, th thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, th there was there's another issue that we've we've kind of been trying to to work through on the committee a bit, and and it has to do with. Um, with, with carbon capture, uh, so capturing or pulling greenhouse gases uh, out of the atmosphere. Um, in, in a recent report by the Biden White House, they, they endorse carbon capture and utilization. 
Um, and and they, they talk about the important role. It says, quote, there's a growing scientific consensus that carbon capture, utilization, sequestration, and carbon dioxide removal will likely play an important role in decarbonizing efforts globally. Action in the United States can drive down technology costs, accelerate uh, the deployment of the technology around the world. And they say they're committed to accelerating it. Um, do, do, the environmental justice report appeared to take a, a little bit different approach. Do you have an opinion on whether or not you believe that, that that using carbon capture and removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere should be a solution as we move forward? Well, in my opinion, I think we shouldn't put the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the first place. I'm concerned about uh, the, the livelihood of my five-year-old son, grandson, and seven generations to come. But I also feel that when we look at solutions, again, we have to go to the communities. There are some, there are some com communities that might support carbon capture and some that might not. So I think the solution lies within, with consulting with those communities that will be greatly impacted by it. So if the communities are on board, you think we should, we should just have local consultation, which I believe Ms. Cooley cited at one point as well. Um, you think that that's a, 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 the way we should handle how to perhaps use that technology or not? Well, if that community is open to the technology, yes, if they're against it, I think that, again, you have to have consultation because at the end of the day, I think you, you mentioned, someone mentioned, we can't force people to do things. We see that with the COVID vaccine, but I think that we can find ways in which we can come to some kind of common ground on how we're going to address these problems, whether it's through carbon capture or some other way. Um, the, the report um, makes note, and again, the, the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council report, um, it, it, it says that um, there should be an end to subsidies to investor-owned utilities. Um, the, the biggest incentive or subsidy that the investor-owned utilities uh, benefit from is actually the incentives for wind and solar, uh, the, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit. Does that, is the, is the task force opposed to those subsidies as well? Do you think we should remove those and move I, I can't, I do not speak for the task force, but uh, I, I think that, you know, you may want to ask the, t ask for a consensus. You got to remember people represent places from around the country. So I don't speak on behalf of the task force and I can't, I don't have an opinion on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, next up, uh, Rep. Levin, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Castor. I, I do have questions for the panel, but uh, first I want to briefly address, uh, frankly, the disappointing and inaccurate comments about my state, the great state of California, made by my friend and, and my colleague, Mr. Graves, uh, who uh, seems to uh, often confuse electricity rates with electricity bills. He's fond of talking about electricity rates, but our constituents, his and mine, we ultimately all pay bills and more uh, impacts those bills than solely rates. So if we take a look at the facts, as I know uh, my friend likes reminding colleagues to do, we find that Louisiana has significantly higher electricity bills than California. In fact, Louisiana ranks 41st with some of the highest electricity bills in the nation. And let us not forget another important point. Clean energy sources are now generally cheaper than fossil fuels. In fact, in 2020, the EIA published an analysis that found that solar power is 20% to 50% cheaper than it had projected just the year before. The analysis goes on to say this, solar is now the cheapest electricity source in history. I'll repeat that. Solar is now the cheapest electricity source in history. The bottom line is that every few years, we hear about the predicted death of California. I've been involved in California public affairs and politics for my entire adult life. And every once in a while we hear, oh, California is dead. And every few years when we hear that, we know that it's only a matter of time before those prognosticators are proven completely wrong once again. So my standing invite to my friend, Mr. Graves uh, exists to visit our great state of California anytime, meet with our policy leaders, ask them tough questions. Bring your fossil fuel industry talking points, whatever you want to do. Let's actually have a good discussion rather than reciting tired talking points. And I'll also say this. This past year, we found that California is head and shoulders above any other state 
when it comes to creating jobs and growing our economy. We have added more than 1.3 million jobs since April of last year. That's equal to the entire workforce in Nevada and it's larger than the growth in Texas and New York. Of course, we have challenges. No state is perfect. We've got a ton of work to do. We have problems that, will, that, that have to be solved, but let's stay in the realm of facts. So I'm gonna turn now to UCLA's Dr. Park and, and go Bruins. Uh, I wanted to ask about grid reliability. How could an unreliable electric grid worsen the impacts of extreme heat on low-income workers and students? Thank you, Representative Levin. Go Bruins, indeed. So grid reliability uh, would be a, a, a terrible issue, especially in, in light of when extreme tends to hit, right? If your electricity is failing when the demand is high, which in the summer tends to be, right, when the temperature is high and people are running their air conditioning, Given what we know about heat's detrimental effects on student learning, and by the way, very divergent and unequal effects uh, by race on student learning, as well as on worker uh, safety and health, I think it would be a big problem. Thank you for that. Ms. Cooley, I wanna to turn to you. What kind of access do Native American communities have when it comes to clean energy generation? And are there resources that we can provide to help make sure that our Native communities have access to clean electricity? Thank you for that question, Representative, Representative Levin. Um, Native American communities do have access to the resources such as wind and solar that are required to develop clean energy facilities. What they don't have is the adequate or reliable financing, the training resources are access to those um, renewable energy careers and also the infrastructure. Um, they, they could greatly help in reducing the reliance and negative impacts on fossil fuels and nuclear, well, nuclear energy. Um, as I come from a nation who has heavily relied on in the past on fossil fuel, that in um, extractive in industry, I, the potential is great. We just have to tap into it. We need that support in the form of financing and access. So um, I just want to also say that if you invest in this uh, um, type of infrastructure for tribal communities. They also have the opportunity in the future to help other uh, non-tribal communities if there were ever to be some type of uh, natural disaster. And I think a good example is the Blue Lake Rancheria tribe in Northern California. Uh, during the wildfires uh, in the past couple of years uh, when PG Gene E shut off the electricity to reduce wildfire threat. Their microgrid actually supported surrounding tribal, uh, surrounding non-tribal communities, and also patients that were most at risk. And so, with that, um, thank you for the question. Well, thank you, and I'm out of time. So, Chair Casper from the great state of California, I yield back. Thank you, Rep. Levin. Next, we'll go to Rep. Carter. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all of the panel members for being here today. Mr. Holly, I'd like to, to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and I wanna thank you, first of all, for testifying today and sharing what I believe is an important view that um, on the issue of environmental justice, we, you and I share many of the same concerns about the policies um, that my colleagues and, and I have been discussing. And it also appears we share a passion for fishing. And as the <laughs> representative of the entire coast of Georgia, over hundred miles of pristine coastline. I, I love fishing. In fact, some this is my home. It's where I've lived all my life and some of my fondest memories are, are fishing with my dad as I was growing up. And I wanna make sure that uh, my sons and grandsons have that same experience as I had as well. You and I have engaged before Mr. Holly on, um, on an issue and in, in previously an energy and commerce subcommittee, environmental subcommittee hearing. And I wanna revisit some of that. It had to do with um, the lessons that we learned from the cancellation of the Atlantic Coast Pipeline mm -hmm. and the harm that it did to communities. In your testimony for today's hearing, you echo some of those thoughts when you, when you say that you fear the same will happen to healthy, thriving communities that have relied on good paying oil and gas jobs for generations. Can you, uh, can you just uh, for my reference and for the reference of my colleagues, can you speak just for a little bit about the effects of removing good paying jobs and industries from environmental justice communities? 
absolutely. But first, I want to tell you, I, I docked in Savannah when I took the boat to Florida. So I was there. Thank <laughs> but, you. We um, appreciate that. Our economy but, appreciate I, I really, you know, like I said, I had a chance to go back to Southwest Virginia, uh, where my grandfather was a black coal miner. I'm telling you, I saw the poverty that exists there, and it's, it's a shame. And again, I know a lot of folks who live in Louisiana, live down in Texas, and all those places who are right now, they have jobs within the oil and gas industry, and they are very, very concerned about what is going to happen if their jobs go away. Their, their lifestyles will be completely disrupted. And again, these people have been working, one of my guys has been working there for 27 years. And so to try to train someone who's 54 on another job at that age, I just think it's a little unrealistic. Absolutely. So what would you say that, um, where are the areas that are most at risk for this, with this kind of energy poverty as you describe? Energy poverty exists, it seems to think about energy poverty, it's not a white or black issue, it's an American issue. And it's, it's, it's in these people in these vulnerable communities, it's rural, it's senior citizens, it's, it's minority and low income communities. Those are the ones right now who are struggling the most. Those are the ones right now that this environmental justice is supposed to protect, but these are the ones right now who are struggling with energy poverty. And you can't have a conversation without including both of them. And when you talk about energy poverty um, and how some of these Americans are spending more than 25% or more of their total income on their electric bill, it's, it's been reported that the price of gas has gone up over 48% from a year ago. With these price increases in gas and nearly all other goods, as we know, inflation is going up as well. How, what's the effect going to be on environmental justice communities? And will they see, and will this increase energy poverty in our country? Absolutely, because energy is a fixed price. When the price goes up at the pump, you experience it everywhere. Even the cost, even the cost of a head of lettuce, a gallon of milk, everything goes up when the cost of energy goes up. When you go out to dinner, if you got a couple of dollars to spend out at a restaurant, your meal is going to go up because it costs more to cook the food or natural gas. So these people will be impacted more so than anybody else. You know, um, you touched a little bit on your test in your testimony when you note that we're encouraging greater adoption of electric vehicles, and I, I think that's great. We all think it's great, but. 90% of electric vehicle owners earn over $100,000 a year. If energy prices and gas continue to go up, what groups are going to have to end up bearing the higher costs? Will it be those making over $100,000 or is, is it going to be the environmental justice community? It's going to be the environmental justice communities for sure. Obviously Absolutely. it is. <laughs> yeah. that, you know, that's, what, that's what really frustrates me sometimes because I, I just don't think that some of my colleagues understand that the impact of, of, of higher energy prices impacts the, the lowest incomes the most. Look, I, I want, you know, and, and I, I'm, I got 18 seconds left and I, and I always have to mention that Georgia is the number one forester state in the nation. And I'm proud of what we're doing in way of energy costs. But we have got to address this, and we have got to address climate change, but we've got to address it with an all of the above type energy policy that includes stable, reliable, affordable energy. So thank you, Mr. Holly. I appreciate it, and I yield back. All right, thank you, Mr. Carter. Next up, uh, Rep. Kasten, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all our witnesses. Um, and I feel like I got to be the broken record because I feel compelled to say this every time. And I know you've heard it before. And I know you all know it's true. You just don't like to acknowledge that it's true. If you can heat your home, if you can keep your lights on, if you can drive your car without burning fossil fuel, you don't have to pay for fossil fuel. It's freaking awesome. Saves a lot of money. Stop this nonsense that it's expensive. We have to invest capital in order to save money. And that is an investment. Period. Full stop. Stop pretending it's not true. It's a problem. If you are in the business of extracting fossil fuel or you are paid by people who are in that business, I get it. We need to make sure that those people are protected and make it through this transition, but please don't shill for that. We're looking out for the American people here. To that end, Ms. Flowers, I'd like to start with you because you mentioned energy efficiency, which is of course the way we do this. Um, and you mentioned some of the challenges that some of the folks in your community have had getting access to energy efficiency in their homes, which of course is going to give them hotter showers, colder beers with less money. Um, a lot of utilities, a lot of states have tried to provide resources to provide the upfront capital, to amortize that capital. It clearly hasn't worked as well as it should have to make sure that the neediest among us get access to those more efficient homes. Any suggestions on what we can or should do federally 
to, to accelerate the access to capital for people who, as my friend Mr. Carter says, may not be able to afford that initial investment, but man, they'll save a lot of money once that investment's made. Well, I think among the many things, thank you for the question. Um, it's not my area of expertise, but I will say this, uh, just as a consumer and, and what I've seen talking to people who've had issues with uh, having access to capital, I think first of all, we should make sure that there are green banks that are set up in that communities that in communities, um, these EJ communities, that capital is available so that the businesses there can benefit. Because oftentimes what happens, no matter who's responsible, where it comes in, the communities don't benefit from it. And somebody comes in from the outside, takes it and leaves and leaves the community poor. And we need to change that. We also need to make sure that the homes are energy efficient. Uh, they're, in Alabama, for an example, my home state, which I love dearly, we are now Tornado Alley. And a lot of people are living in mobile homes. And one of the reasons why we've had a high rate of uh, people dying has been because they live in mobile homes. But they're also not energy efficient, a lot of them. Pamela Rush, who I mentioned before, her power bills were easily four and $500 a month. And she was living off approximately 900 to $1,000 a month. So we have to make sure that our homes are more energy efficient, but make the capital available in those communities that need it the most. Well, thank you, and I, you know, I hope in our infrastructure plan we're able to make sure that that capital is available because it's an it's an investment it makes all Americans wealthier, and let's let's do it for good and selfish reasons. Um, uh, Dr. Park, um, your testimony was fascinating, and I'm particularly interested in some of the what you mentioned about some of the regional differences and how these costs are borne. They um, particularly brought to mind of one of our prior witnesses, um, uh, Michael Greenstone from University of Chicago, and some of his work. Um, you're, I see you nodding your head, so hopefully that means you are in fact connected, because I sure hope you, you folks are collaborating. Um, as you know, he's been you know, dedicated a long time to calculating the social cost of carbon and now trying to understand the regional differences. Can you give me some sense of these differences that you talked about? Are we talking about a, you know, a 2x difference between regions? Is it a 10x difference? How, what is that disparity in your, in your math that we've seen, and how should we be thinking about that? If we are to embrace markets and market solutions to pricing externalities, how much does it vary regionally? Great. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, Michael Greenstone's work is sort of like the trunk of the tree of knowledge that I'm branching off of. So certainly uh, something I'm familiar with. And if I, if I may, just ten, 10 seconds on a point you made that I think is really important about costs. We've been talking a lot about the potential for uh, clean energy policy to be regressive in terms of who bears the cost. That may in theory be true, but that's sort of like saying that you could die from heart surgery. Yes, but it depends on how you do it and how well you do it. And, and I really, I think, you know, I won't speak on behalf of all of my economist colleagues, but I certainly think that, you know, many would agree that it really comes down to smart policy design. There's nothing inherent to clean energy policy uh, that needs to necessarily be regressive in terms of the realized outcomes uh, for low-income individuals. To your question about regional disparities, I think the honest answer is that we're still learning. Is it 2x? Is it 10x? Is it, you know, 15x? Because I think in part, we know a lot about the physical impacts of climate change and how they vary. You know, I could give you a table, and in fact, I, I maybe I will after uh, our testimony. Uh, you know, with each of our each of the members here, and how many extreme heat days right your constituents can expect in the next 20, 30 years, with quite a bit of precision now. But what we don't yet know very well is just how much individuals in particular areas, depending on their occupation, their industry, their housing stock, the age of their housing stock, how these things affect, you know, the effect of heat on electricity bills, uh, your health, your learning, your productivity, et cetera. And so my guess would be that the regional disparities are very large, which implies, last point I'll make is that, which implies that the federal rule probably will have an import, federal government will have an important role to play in spreading out these risks as climate shocks manifest moving forward. Thank you so much. Uh, I would love to see that data if you have it and yield back. There is no doubt that Rev Kasten would like to see any and all <laughs> of the, the data, and, and we all would. Uh, next, we'll go to Rep Palmer. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, uh, I just want to make a point here uh, in regard to things that have been said by uh, Ms. Flowers. I grew up in Northwest Alabama. I grew up, my dad had maybe an eighth grade education. He was a, a logger. 
we, uh, uh, he logged with a pair of mules and chainsaw. That's what I grew up doing. Later, he started building roof trusses. I've actually been on the roofs of homes, uh, putting new roofs on. So I understand what it is to work in extreme heat, uh, especially considering that I was on the football team at the University of Alabama. And uh, we had practices twice a day on artificial turf that I'm not kidding. The temperature on, on that turf was 110 degrees. So Dr. Park, wouldn't you agree that physical health and condition is a factor in, in uh, how people respond to, to extreme heat or, or heat period? Is physical health uh, a, a factor? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, and I, I just want to point out that my grandparents, my dad's parents lived in a house that was not only heated by a wood burning stove, they cooked on it. Uh, Miss Flowers, I'd put her blackberry cobbler up against anybody uh, from Lowndes County or anywhere else, including Garrett Graves District. I don't know if they know how to make it in Louisiana, but uh, I want to go on and I want to, uh, Miss Coley, uh, though the Navajo people uh, did not arrive in southwestern United States till around 1400, 1450, uh, migrating from Canada and Alaska, I assume uh, uh, your research has shown you uh, and made you aware that there were mega droughts between uh, 900 and 1300 AD that had an enormously negative impact on the indigenous peoples. Uh, who were in those uh, regions at that time. Are you aware of those droughts? Well, first of all, um, that's what the archeologists say where, my, where they say my people from, but I have a different viewpoint on that, but that's another session. Um, these disturbance regimes, such as these mega droughts that you're talking about are happen happening more frequently. And uh, maybe back in my ancestors' days, they didn't happen as much. But yes, they did happen, but they're happening more frequently. Well, actually, actually they were more frequent then and lasted much longer. Some of them lasted over 100 years uh, at that time. And, and, and the science says that uh, it was more arid during that period than any subsequent century. Uh, so the droughts were longer and worse during that time. Uh, and it was because of, of uh, warming. Uh, it was was climate change. Uh, Mr. Holly, I appreciate you being here as, as, as well. I, I want to uh, touch on something about uh, lowering energy costs and, and, and what's happened with hydraulic fracturing and, and how it brought down the cost of, of natural gas. Uh, it not only makes heating costs go down, it also lowers cooling costs. Uh, which should make it uh, uh, more economically feasible for lower income households to keep their homes cooler. Uh, there's uh, a studies out, I've got a, a paper here from Lance at the British Medical Journal. It says there's 17 times more people die from cold than from heat. Uh, I've, I've also found that uh, there's another study that says that the cost of the lower uh, natural gas cost that it's estimated that it saved about 11,000 Americans from dying uh, uh, during the winter every year. Uh, I think of this in the context, and I brought this up many times, and the other witnesses may have been notified that I'd bring this up, but Pembroke Township in Illinois, a town of 2,100 people, 85% African American, they don't have a natural gas pipeline. They're heating their homes with wood burning stoves and propane. and uh, uh, because they can't afford uh, their their uh, utility bills, Do you, would you agree that we that it would be a good thing to get a natural gas pipeline into that township? Uh, that's what Jesse Jackson's trying to do, and other civil rights leaders. Yes, sir, absolutely. And the thing about it is, most time people understand that there are more pipelines running under a city or a state than anything. There are pipelines under there. We do, another pipeline is generating natural gas is not going to hurt anyone. Well, I just want to point out too that even though the the recommendations uh, from the White House was no road improvements and no new pipelines, that that's going to be very detrimental to low income people who desperately need additional infrastructure. My time has expired. I thank the chairman and the witnesses, and I yield back. All right, thank you. Next up, uh, Rep Huffman, you're recognized for five minutes.
Jared, you're muted. Still muted. There we go. It was telling me that I was having a trouble with the host unmuting me. So I think I'm audible now. Am I, am I okay? Oh, good. Because I, I can now talk well, about Kathy's my friend. the host of Blame Her. <laughs> I can now talk about my friend Garrett Graves' stubborn case of California envy. Uh, we have corrected him a few times now on some of these anti-California canards. And I thank my colleague, Mike Levin, for doing a great job of once again, explaining the difference between electricity rates and electricity bills. Uh, but today we heard a new creative uh, set of allegations drawn from a lawsuit, not an actual court decision, but a lawsuit, which is easy enough to file. So I'll just state the obvious in California, like everywhere else, we have industry funded astroturf groups and industry funded lawsuits aimed at blocking climate reforms. But if filing a lawsuit and lobbying a bunch of provocative allegations was enough to make them true, then Rudy Giuliani would still have a law license and Donald Trump would be president. Uh, with very few exceptions, uh, the people and experts who have dedicated their lives to environmental justice and protecting disadvantaged communities uh, are not hostile to clean air, to clean water, to clean energy. They don't worship at the altar of fossil fuels. Most of them agree Fossil fuel pollution is a huge problem, a really bad thing that climate change impacts are a huge problem. And they, uh, if we care about EJ communities and disadvantaged communities, then we need more bold climate action, not less. And so that's why I'm, I'm really pleased that President Biden's American Jobs Plan commits 40% of the benefits of climate and clean energy investments to disadvantaged communities. And just last week, I had a chance in my district to see what that kind of investment could look like. A new renewably powered microgrid at the Redwood Coast Airport. This is a partnership that includes local Indian tribes and it'll provide clean renewable power and flexible power that eliminates greenhouse gas emissions and builds resilience to climate impacts. That's the kind of thing we're doing in California. And, and Ms. Cooley, you mentioned this. You, you mentioned the Blue Lake Rancheria, which is in my district. That was a previous microgrid that I was pleased to support, but they are one of the partners on this new microgrid. And I wanna give you a chance to respond to Mr. Holly's claims. Um, he's a, a, a very effective witness. He's become a bit of a frequent flyer for our Republican friends in these hearings, uh, but his views are really an outlier uh, among those who have dedicated their lives to serving disadvantaged communities. This notion that, um, maintaining our dependency on dirty fossil fuels is somehow good for low-income people of color because it provides cheap energy and jobs. So I wonder uh, if you could speak to what you think of that view and what you've seen happening in California, where I believe the opposite is happening, where our climate programs are generating revenue that's being used for weatherization and any number of other things that are actually helping disadvantaged communities. Thank you, Representative Huffman, for that question. Um, as, a, as someone who is invited here to talk about the findings of the stack report, I'll tell you that the, the tribal nations um, have that opportunity, like you said, not to be so reliant on the central grid on extractive detrimental, the fossil fuel industry. I come from a community that has seen and felt the impacts of um, positive but mostly negative um, and I guess decreasing the reliance um, also increases the resilience against climate uh, extremes such as power outages and also will decrease the long-term costs on uh, less re uh, and le less reliance off of energy sources uh, off the reservation. Uh, this could help tribes really achieve that energy and economic dependence, sovereignty, and also the stability. So um, that, that that's what I would answer with. Thank you. Okay, Doc, Doc, Dr. Park, same question for you on the jobs side. Uh, and by the way, you know I love UCLA too because. Not everyone can get into UC Santa Barbara and they need a second choice. So thank you for being part of our hearing. And uh, please uh, speak to Mr. Mr. Holly's uh, 
testimony as it pertains to the upside economically of clean air and new jobs from clean energy. Sure, thank you for that. Um, I guess maybe I'll start with a general point, which is that, again, we've been focusing a lot on the potential costs of clean energy, but there are a lot of hidden benefits that research shows will benefit uh, environmental justice communities, uh, low-income communities, uh, possibly the most, in, particularly in terms of reduced air pollution, which we now know has very detrimental effects, not only on, on health, but student cognition, even onset of dementia, worker productivity, all of these things. The oil and gas workers, you know, uh, Mr. Holly referred to, yes, they may rely on that industry for their jobs, but the work that they are doing is also silently poisoning them and affecting uh, their health as well. So, you know, these are things that we, we need to bear in mind as we talk, have a holistic conversation, I think, about the costs and benefits uh, of climate policy. Thank you, Madam Chair. You'll back. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Rep Gonzalez. Good to see you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Castor and Ranking Member Graves for holding this hearing today and, and to our distinguished witnesses uh, for their testimony. Uh, I think it's fair to say advocating for environmental justice is relatively easy uh, to just say it. Uh, what's not easy is, is facing politically inconvenient facts about the feasibility of some of the policies proposed, or in some cases, recognizing that aggressive advocacy may direct community attention away from problems that pose a greater or certainly more immediate uh, public health threat on the communities in question. I'd argue this political dilemma has been on full display uh, over the last few weeks. Despite the Biden administration setting ambitious climate targets, labeling ca carbon emissions as an existential threat that will disproportionately hurt low-income and minority Americans, uh, they're O o lobbying OPEC openly to pump more oil, knowing that this will bring down the high gas prices currently hurting low-income families. Uh, Mr. Holly, I don't, I don't want to spend a ton of time on California. Uh, I've lived there before. It's a beautiful state, uh, but it's run horribly. In, in my view, uh, Ohio's run much better, uh, which is why I live there. Uh, but uh, in any event, um, after California implemented their, their cap and trade policy, uh, researchers found it, it did not deliver local emission reductions, public health, or air quality benefits to residents in low-income communities. Uh, what it did do is it raised their utility bills, uh, which we know are already more than 8% of their income, four times higher than what wealthy American families pay. Uh, again, I, I, I have a lot of uh, fond memories of my time in California, but emulating their climate policies is not something that, that I, I think we should be doing nationally, and certainly not in Ohio. Uh, my question is, how important is it to low-income minority families that we keep their energy prices affordable? It's very important. And the thing about it, it's just not me saying this. You had Reverend Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, and the president of uh, uh, God, I can't, Mark Muriel, um, all saying right now that we need natural gas as we transition to clean energy. If we don't, it's going to raise the cost to low-income individuals, period. Yeah. And I think that's the really important point is, again, I... Maybe there's some folks who are saying we shouldn't address this at all. I'm not hearing that in this committee on, on either side of the aisle, but I think there's a question of how do we do it and how do we do it in a way that's thoughtful uh, and, and isn't going to hurt the very communities that we're trying to help. Uh, and with that, I want to turn to Ms. Coleman Flowers. I'd like to touch on the report you worked on with the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Um, there were some things that you advocated as non-beneficial to environmental justice communities, and, and I just found them perplexing. So one is nuclear energy, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, second, carbon capture, road improvements, and the final one, R&D, which is probably the one thing all of us on this committee agree on, I think. Uh, can you explain the thinking that, that led to suggest that Congress and the White House should eliminate funding for these projects moving forward? Again, I can't speak, and thank you for the question, but I, I can't speak on behalf of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. There were, there were about 26 other members who gave their opinion and they had various reasons for doing that. And I'm only one person. But uh, I think that that everyone that's on that, on that council is trying to find a way to address the problems in their communities. Uh, I would like to, to say and, and to offer that whatever, whatever we ultimately do, I think all of us believe that there should be a just transition. 
be it for people in environmental justice communities or those people that are going to be impacted by the changes that we have to make so that we can make sure that my grandson has a future in terms of a livable planet. Can I ask you, do you personally think we should eliminate R&D funding? Re research and development, personally, uh, no, I don't. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Holly, I don't know if I'll get this question in, but it, in your testimony, you highlighted that over 60% of the world's cobalt is extracted from Congo, and in most cases mined by Congolese children who are forced into slave labor, which is atrocious. Earlier this month, a, a group of more than 40 progressives, 40 progressive groups signed a letter addressed to President Biden and members of Congress that we should prioritize environmental concerns and access to affordable clean energy over issues such as human rights abuses, which includes Congolese children in slavery. As you know, China has been detaining hundreds of thousands of Uyghur Muslims in internment camps. Uh, how should global human rights injustices figure into our thinking on environmental justice? We need to include that. And that's my, that's my whole thing. I'm like, how can we talk about environmental justice and it just be us here in America? It's gotta be a global issue. If not, then we, we're hypocrites ourselves. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think it, it highlights, look, there's there's important trade-offs. There are difficult trade-offs, not an easy issue. Uh, and I, I hope that we can get to a place where we start to recognize the inherent trade-offs uh, that are required to actually make progress. And with that, I yield back. Okay, next up, uh, Rep. Brownlee, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I apologize for being late to the hearing. I was tied up with a constituent who's had a tragic death in their family and I just couldn't get away um, in time for the hearing, but thank you for having it. Um, uh, my, my question goes to uh, Dr. Park. Um, I represent Ventura County in California. Uh, Ventura County is not the hottest county in our country, but it is heating faster than any other county uh, in the country. So. Uh, this is a, a very important issue to farm workers, to our ag community, uh, to our community at whole. Oxnard is a city uh, in Ventura County. Oxnard is a working class uh, family with a lot of uh, EJ impacts and, you know, home to several super fine sites, uh, et cetera. One thing the, the city of Oxnard has done um, locally is that they offer free fruit trees uh, to their uh, residents to plant in their front yard, um, not only for food, but for shade. Um, so I guess my question you had in, in your comments, uh, in your testimony, you talked about we need, we need to look at smarter at adaptation policies. Shade is, you know, so certainly something that comes to my mind quickly when we think about heat, heat equity, uh, and at, you know, adaptation. What are some of the other, what you would consider smart at adaptation policies that you would suggest? Great, thank you for that question. Uh, just a quick story on that note. I, I will never forget uh, driving back from uh, a workshop in UC Santa Barbara through Oxnard on a, a, a hot day where we had wildfires and the smoke was billowing through and we had agricultural workers still working in the heat and the smoke just to kind of give you a visual of the kinds of pressures that I, I imagine your constituents are facing. In terms of smart adaptation policy, I mean, you mentioned trees. I'm not as familiar with the efficacy of trees, but I do know that they have cooling benefits, particularly uh, in urban areas, uh, although you wanna be careful about the, the water stress, right, in a, in a state like California. So it, there are trade-offs, certainly. Um, but it, this, this may sound a little mundane, but even something as simple as, as making sure that our schools, right, and, and homes in low-income communities have reliable grids and access to air conditioning when they need it. Uh, you know, air conditioning sometimes gets a bad rap in environmental circles because if, if the electricity grid is not clean, it can lead to more greenhouse gas emissions. But if it is a, a clean electricity grid, we know that it, air conditioning has, can have uh, life-saving benefits, uh, particularly, again, for uh, disadvantaged communities. So I, those are just two suggestions, but I think there are many more if we start to look more carefully uh, under the hood in terms of what, what kinds of uh, investments and policies we could pursue there. 
So California has, um, you know, laws with regards to protecting our farm workers, particularly from heat, making sure that they have water and shade, et cetera. Is there, can you make any determinations uh, about the impacts of those laws um, and, you know, a, a quantifiable improvement? That's another great question. And I'm, you know, I'm going to be that uh, the typical researcher who says we need more data and we need to do more research. But in this case, I think we really do need more data to know exactly what kinds of policies will be most effective at protecting workers uh, from climate risks, whether that's heat or something else, in part because as we've learned from, I think, the COVID pandemic, th there are difficult trade-offs involved when you're trying to regulate the workplace from environmental hazards to make sure that the economic costs are reasonable. I, I, I tend to be an optimist and, and believe that there are ways to do this. And certainly in our data, we observe that the heat, the impact of heat on injuries appears to be declining over time in California, which may have something to do with the fact that California was the first state uh, to implement uh, mandatory workplace heat, heat standards. But uh, as a researcher, I do think there needs to be more data collection and more research to really understand what kinds of policies uh, we want to be uh, supporting at at a federal or local level in terms of attitude. So, so there's not any comparative data that you have for other states that haven't implemented uh, rules in the workplace uh, compared to California. I would assume that since California is one of very few states that have, that the risks that you you spoke of in your testimony have, have got to be greater across the, when you think the, of the whole country. I hesitate to, to make extrapolations, but that kind of comparative analysis is, is certainly on my wish list of things that we should, we should do urgently. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Rep Bonamici. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves. And uh, to the witnesses, I, I have read all your testimony and I very much appreciate your you're being here today, the record-breaking heat wave across the Pacific Northwest last month was one of the deadliest natural disasters in my home state of Oregon, and my heart goes out to the families of the 116 Oregonians who lost their lives. Those are those we know of so far. There were many more across the region. Uh, I want to repeat and emphasize this fact. Last week, the extreme temperatures claimed more than 100 lives in my home state of Oregon. People died in their homes because of the heat. And as temperatures surged to unprecedented triple digits, low-income neighborhoods became heat islands. They're surrounded by concrete, excessive emissions from highways. Many seniors lacked air conditioning or even fans. Communities of color live on streets with fewer trees and green spaces to provide shade. And that's, uh, as we know, because of historic uh, red line policies from the past. Dr. Vivek Shandas from Portland State University has been studying these disparities for decades and during the heat wave. He and his son actually used a thermal camera and they went around and measured temperatures in different neighborhoods across Portland. In Southeast Portland, Dr. Shandis recorded an air temperature of 124 degrees. That was 25 degrees higher than the measurement around the same time in more prosperous neighborhoods. So we can't ignore the consequences of urban heat islands for communities of color and low-income communities. And scientists have already found that the deadly heat wave would have been virtually impossible without human-caused climate change. We have to take this bold, comprehensive action to protect our communities from similar disasters in the future. So Dr. Park, I'm going to follow up on Brownlee's questions. Far too many lives were lost during the heat wave, and I, I'm, I'm on the Education Labor Committee, and I'm particularly concerned about workplace conditions. Tragically, Sebastian Francisco Perez, a 38-year-old farm worker, died at his work site in St. Paul, Oregon, uh, when temperatures were 115 degrees uh, in the Willamette Valley on June 26. This is unacceptable. Uh, we know that the climate crisis means that more people like Sebastian are working in hazardous conditions. And Oregon followed California and implemented standards, but it was after Mr. Perez passed. Dr. Park, so what steps should Congress take to make sure people have access to workforce protections, workplace protections in the, ex in the extent uh, and with the threats of extreme uh, weather, but also we have the wildfire smoke that's becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah, Representative, thank you for that question. And just, you know, the, the case, the tragic case that you just uh, mentioned is, is something that is consistent with our data. You know, one of the surprising things that we found is that uh, the effect of heat on injuries actually appears to be larger for younger 
workers, workers in their 20s and 30s and 40s, as opposed to workers in their 50s and 60s. We still can't say definitively why, but it may have something to do with the kinds of uh, occupations or industries and the dangerous work environments that, that they're working in when the extreme heat hits. Uh, in, in terms of policy responses, you know, again, I, I hesitate to make uh, blanket policy recommendations, but I think it's, uh, I think the research clearly shows uh, that this is an issue that official statistics historically uh, may have understated the importance of. And, and again, I know we've been talking a lot about the, the inequality and, and the, uh, the environmental justice dimension of this, but these are costs that are borne by society as a whole as well. You know, the, wor the worker uh, suffers in terms of pain and medical bills and, uh, and lost wages, but employers suffer uh, lost productivity, retraining costs, hiring costs. We all pay into insurance systems, et cetera. So again, it's just, it's, I think it's important to think of, of the issue of heat and climate risks in general as, as affecting all sectors. Absolutely. And I want to get a question into Ms. Cooley as well. I appreciate your in your testimony, you reference ocean acidification, harmful algal blooms, hypoxia, and the consequences for indigenous livelihoods. Uh, we know that warmer temperatures in the Columbia River are further endangering salmon, which are a fundamental part of the identity, culture, and treaty rights of our Northwest tribes. And in our region, the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission partners with NOAA's Integrated Ocean Observation System to manage a network of observation systems stations and buoys in the Columbia River. So Ms. Cooley, how can Congress better support partnerships with tribes to advance climate science? And what are some of the existing barriers for tribes in accessing funding for resilience efforts? Thank you, Representative. Um, I think one of the main things uh, the US government can do is remove barriers to that tribal sovereignty. Um, as you mentioned, salmon and other subsistence foods are absolutely critical um, actually, many tribes call them critical infrastructure for their ways of life, um, and they use that to respect, include, and also, you know, protect the traditional uh, knowledges. So the investment in funding, uh, again, access to the resources uh, for the training of Native Americans uh, to keep jobs on the reservation, um, I think is critical to the livelihoods um, in terms of their traditional ways of life and um, their, uh, their, their foods that they depend on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. You know, um, Listening to our witnesses today here as we, we close out the hearing, I think I really appreciate your uh, perspectives and that of the members who are coming from different parts of the country. Everyone is kind of suffering through the escalating uh, impacts of the climate crisis. And, but the witnesses today have really bolstered the need to enact our recommendations in our climate crisis action plan released last year into law. And we have an opportunity to do that this summer uh, through the American Jobs Plan, uh, where we want to direct 40% of the benefits of infrastructure investments to environmental justice communities. They have been carrying the a disproportionate burden for too long and that's hopefully what we'll be able to do. So at, uh, thanks again to our terrific witnesses. Uh, without objection, uh, I'd like to enter into the record uh, two reports. First, the introduction from a July 2021 report by the Center for Progressive Reform, Earth Justice, and the Union of Concerned Scientists titled Preventing Double Disasters, How the US EPA Can Protect the Public from Hazardous Chemical Releases worsened by natural disasters. The second is a July 2021 paper titled Widespread Race and Class Disparities in Surface uh, Urban Heat Extremes Across the United States. And I'd also, in the interesting exchange of Ms. Cooley with Representative Palmer over droughts in the Southwest, I just encourage everyone uh, to go back to the most recent national climate assessment that, that really made it clear through a scientific consensus uh, here that lower precipitation, increasing temperatures have, are amplifying droughts, especially in the Southwest. And the National Climate Assessment states specifically that disproportionately is burdening 
uh, our tribal communities. So I encourage you all to refer back to that as well. So without objection, we'll enter Better. those into the record. And uh, Ranking Member Graves, do you have a, uh, have a do you have an request. request? Go ahead. You, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Madam Chair, we have a UC request to submit a letter from the Three River Parish presidents to President Biden regarding uh, some of the uh, employment activities and industrial activities in their three parishes. Um, have a uh, document indicating that uh, electricity rates in California, if the Louisiana rate applied, would go from an average of $124 to $58. And Madam Chair, most importantly, I have a document from the James Beard Foundation showing that uh, Louisiana restaurants far surpass those in Alabama, uh, just to get back and document um, against Mr. Palmer's underhanded comment about our ability to cook. I, uh, is there any objection to that? Okay, then, without objection. I object, I object if he's trying to enter the that false report from Louisiana restaurants. Well, thank you all again uh, for your very insightful testimony. We have a lot, we have our work cut out for us. Uh, thanks again, and we are adjourned.